Hello everyone, uh, it's Friday, uh, Psychoanalysis Day at Sublation Media. Uh, welcome again um, to Sci-Fi, the, 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 the weekly show, podcast, um, about the relationship between psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, politics, theory. Um, great to have my co-host back this week. Hi Elliot, how are you? I'm doing great. Another beautiful day in Newcastle. The fall is coming. The cold great. air is blowing. Um, is, you're in a different room. You're in a different room. And you're in Los Angeles, Alfie. We've we've fully mm. traded places. We've traded Hello. Yeah, right. locales. Mm, um, beautiful downtown Los Angeles. So um, yeah. before I introduce our, uh, our guest for today, really excited to have um, Mark Gerard Murphy with us. Um, do just check out the rest of the podcast in this playlist or on Sublation Media. Like I said, we're out every Friday. And we've had some really big ones recently with Elenka Zupancic, with Nadan Dola. Uh, but also last week, um, interviewed Sergio Aguiar, Mexican uh, writer, about concepts of truth. Uh, we talked about the different concepts and ideas of truth in conspiracy theory, science, documentary filmmaking, and neoliberalism, and sort of discussed, you know, which of these, um, which of these uh, things has the best and healthiest concept of truth. It was one of my favorite uh, conversations, actually. So please do check out those as well. So um, brilliant to have Mark Jared Murphy with us today. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mark. Mark is a lecturer at St. Mary's University in London, where I was actually visiting for the first time the other week, which was great, and, and saw Mark do a, a fantastic talk. He's a Lacanian psychoanalysis, but also trained in theology, and we're going to talk about the relationship between this, and he's interested in the relationship between spirituality, psychoanalysis, and also digital media. And the talk I, I saw Mark do was about social media and digital media and how to use psychoanalysis to think through what's happening in, in digital culture and society today. So we're going to talk about all that, as well as maybe some incel and <laughs> discussions and <laughs> a bit of love. Uh, but thanks for joining us, Mark. How's it going? Yeah, yeah, it's been, been good. Um, you know, was, uh, I, I was just uh, saying to Alfie, you know, I was, uh, whilst I was at St. Mary, I was, I was there, you know, digitally because I, 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 I was pretty ill. I had a I had to go for an operation, and then whilst I had the operation, I ended up with COVID. So I had to sort of beam myself into into Saint Mary's. But yeah, it's uh, thank you for having me on the show, and thank you, Elliot. Um, thank you for allowing uh, me the time to be able to talk about some of this stuff. So yeah, you've already mentioned already what the, some of the things that I'm interested in. Um, as a, as you just, I'm, I'm a, I, I've trained in philosophy and theology, uh, and I did my masters and my my PhD on Lacanian psychoanalysis and its relationship to spirituality. And with when I was doing my PhD, what I what I was really interested in, and this this came from um, um, reading <coughs> um, reading two two scholars for Dennis Turner and um, and Eugene Thacker. You've heard Eugene Thacker sort of a uh, you know, the um, he. You know, it was a little throwaway comment about John of the Cross, and he's talking about John of the Cross. A little throwaway comment, and he said that what John of the Cross was aiming at in, in his in his whole exposition is he's not aiming at some dark experience, some moment of experientialist bliss in, in his writings. Rather, what he's trying to talk about is talking about the liberate the liberate um, how how. Thing, how you, he's talking about the darkness of experience itself, that the experience, the, the darkness of experience in, itself, and how that realization can lead to a type of subjective transformation. Now he doesn't take it too far; he just jumps on to something else. And my my PhD th thesis was looking at the concept of subjective destitution in Lacanian psychoanalysis, and how that's related to the dark night of the soul but talking about it from a non-experientialist perspective. Insofar that spirituality today, if you look at the language of it, it's all about experientialism. It's all about this promise of experientialist bliss. It's very much, if you look at how it's caught up today, it's, it's very much in uh, caught up with new age ideology, which comes from new thought in the 19th century and is sort of uh, wrapped up with ideas that come from William James. The idea that religion is ultimately a fake institutional reality, but right at the very core of it is an experience. And that experience, that exper experience itself is the point of authenticity. So that was where I did my PhD thesis on. I'm, I'm, I'm aiming to get that um, published now. It's going, well, trying to with Palgrave and having a back and forth. But what I'm writing on now is I think things need to be updated. 
uh, because if you look at where we're at now, uh, you can't talk about any of this without looking at the materialist conditions that we mm. live in. And the materialist conditions that we're, we're, we're talking about now is ultimately the attention economy. You know, the attention economy, how that's tied up in the experience economy. The idea of the experience economy is a term that came by Pine and Gilmore, where the idea that what matters is not so much commodities like objects and things that we enjoy, but the experience that's attached to them. You know, the idea you buy X, Y or Z and you can there, there is some promise of experientialist bliss tied to whatever service. And we can see how that's that's um, you know become much worse with our right. digital economy. And so, so what experience I'm, is higher than all the objects that we exactly. interact with, which are not really real, but they is the is the pitch of like yeah, the that's new it. And I, and I think right. what what I've been trying to think about this more, and I think Todd McGowan talks about the pro. I think you mentioned this, Alfie. You know, I've been thinking about um, um, how capital works by by promise, right? Yeah. You, you mentioned this. You said it. So it's this idea of um, withheld promise. And so if you look at how, you know, our attention economy works, the idea that our, our attention, how it's held um, by the Latus, you know, the, the, the gadget, the, the, the smartphone, how it's constantly held, how we're caught up in this economy of endlessly writing. We create ourselves as objects to be experienced and consumed by the other. But we also engage in this endless writing with the promise of that, you know, with with, with that at the end of you know, whatever we're doing, engaging this, there will be some type of experience right. that will be given yeah. to us. Okay. Yeah, no, following that, I think so. Let me let me just uh, see if I'm getting this correctly because I, I do think this is really fascinating and, and unique that you're you're basically um, first of all, let, let's say you just I'm just trying to summarize what you said. <laughs> you're, you're situating this kind of analysis in the in the new context of capital, right? The logic of capital, and in particular, what you called in your talk screen capitalism or mm -hmm. as you're saying now the attention economy so first of all we've got the material conditions of right now uh, and then what you're trying to think about is how this new there's new forms of subjectivity developing in this um world of the attention economy of screen capitalism and there's a certain kind of spirituality to these things yes um, where you know so as it were this this then combines the that this brings in the kind of theological perspective, right? That if we're to understand how capitalism functions, you know, by promise and what you were just describing, we, we need to see that there's a spiritual side to our engagement with these new features of the attention economy and screen capitalism. Is that, is that right? That's right. Yeah, that's, 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 that's pretty much what it is. But the, my next thing is there's obviously the, there's two reactions. You, you say, well, we can just uh, despiritualize you know, whatever we're in, despiritual. I think that's the name of an album. <laughs> but it's uh, uh, you can despiritual and end up with a fully Marxist perspective. But my my argument is is more along that well, we don't want to put spirituality in the bin. You know, I don't think it's yeah. it's something. But it's this I, we need to go back and look at uh, what I think pre modern uh, permutations of what spirituality is seen, like John mm. of the Cross, Pseudo Dionysus. Uh, Nicholas of Cusa, and you can see in in uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis, Nicholas of Cusa comes up a lot, especially with with Miller in in his writing, Be because it's this idea that what's at the heart of if you read them and you take away the the type of experientialist um, hermeneutic that permeates everything, a lot of these writers weren't talking about an experience. They weren't talking. If you look at like pseudo Dionysus, for instance, and read his mystical theology, there's very little reference to internal state. He's talking about a structure, and that structure is ultimately one of a structure of hiddenness, and it's one that ultimately uh, is about how we can become opaque. We become opaque to ourselves. We become opaque to the big other. Um, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pa pass this in more psychoanalytic terms. But I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in that sort of darkness spirituality or darkness mystical theology as a way of resisting the the experience attention economy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how, but I think there's a bit really interesting book that's come out. Uh, it's a, you know, I, I think it's into it's called How to Do Nothing by Jenny Odell. Um, it's and it's uh, you know resisting the attention economy, and I think it's this. What I'm really interested in is how can we become useless? We, you know, if our spirituality today is all about optimization of the self about how we can become ultimately very useful that you know yes. um, by becoming useful and engaging in these disciplines these technologies of the self we can become you know uh the, these these creatures you know that have 
a beautiful experience just around the corner. How can we resist that? How can we resist experientialism? How can we can we become absolutely useless? Yeah. And I think that I think that there's something in that, and I'm trying to try to articulate how that happens. And I think it's got something to do with the Lacanian concept of the past. And I think it's got something to do with subjective destitution. And I'm, I'm, this is where I where, where I'm where I'm formulating. But what, what yeah, do you I'm, Alfie, I think yeah, I think you have something, uh, Alfie. I have um, a question, but. Okay, yeah. Like, uh, no, I just want to clarify something, and then I, I'll pass it to you earlier. But um, no, I, I I I wanted to say that I agree with this impulse to maintain spirituality within the the discussion because not because I personally have any attachment to concepts of you know theological or spiritual concepts, but because it's there anyway. You know, mm -hmm. so if you if you argue that there's nothing, if you argue for a removal of let's say religious thinking or spirituality what ends up happening is we relate to capitalism in a spiritual and religious way whilst being deceived into thinking that we relate to it in a rational or uh, non-spiritual way whatever the opposite of spiritual might be um so i think it's it's important to, to to start from the point you're starting from and keep spirituality in the discussion because part of the way we relate to capitalism and as you're saying I'm, I'm convinced by your point actually about the attention economy that there is something particularly spiritual about what goes on here so i, I wanted to say that i agree with that i think it's important and, and really interesting but i also wanted to ask about now you come you're bringing in a, yet, a, yet another kind of field of thinking which is self-help here mm -hmm. um so you know we've there are lots of moving parts of this argument. I'm just trying to like make sure I've got it. But like, I, I, I think what you're saying is that self-help discourses have grabbed hold of um, spirituality and capitalized on it in, in a proper oh, yes. sense of, of making it into something where we become these subjects um, who who are useful to capitalism. And that is, of course, right. I mean, you know, um, everything from Fitbits and smartwatches to Jordan Peterson to, you know, Alain de Botton, you know, the whole self-help industry is about turning you in a certain way into a better worker and turning you, you know, I guess it's the Mark Fisher argument, turning you, your attention away from the structure of capitalism and in onto you. And how can you then kind of be a better subject and, and a better capitalist subject? So you're trying to kind of resist that. Um, yeah. But the question I had was, how does self-help relate to the internet or digital capitalism or screen capitalism? How do those two things connect? Well, um, I, if you, if you, for instance, if, I think it's it's it, it's pretty much permeated right the way through. I think if you look um, on if you're on Twitter, Facebook, or whatever, there are these endless, um, you know, for instance, there was a, an interesting point about the commodification of. Of therapy, and I think you know, therapeutic th the the rise of therapy speak as as an aspect of of that self help. You know, because self help isn't just a purely spiritual; it's psycho spiritual. You know, it's 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 an aspect of that. And you can see these apps like I, f I forget these um the, the name of the term. Uh, is the Better Help app? Better Help help. Yeah. That's oh, exactly I, I I I have clients from that app. Do you? Private clients. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's a, we can see also that there is. Feel free to talk poorly of it. <laughs> no, well, I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm. I'm just saying. That I'm. Uh, I'm not making any big wide critique. And again, oh, no, these are ideas I'm trying to work. I'm trying to work through. And this is yeah. something I'm trying to argue. Trying to. But there is, I have an intuitive, an intuitive sense that I do believe the attention economy and how digital, uh, the the, the digital economy that we're in now, is inherently caught up with a type of spiritual discourse that presents itself as a type of um through through self-help and uh the, the type and, and, and therapy speak that pretty much that's pretty much everywhere you can see it in how people just casually mention the D, you know and reference the dsm5 constantly as a type of book of names that you know uh, that allows them to you know such a their identity who they are and whatnot right. it's it's everywhere but also if even if you look and say stuff like the metaverse and uh, the you, you're looking at VR. If you uh, the, I, I, there was um, if you can, I, is there any way of sharing the screen on this, or does it not work this way? Um, no, you I think can. this might this. Yeah, well, I'll give you me one second. If you uh, just we've, I'll... Never, <laughs> we've never actually tried that, but uh, <laughs> I, I mean the best thing might be if you send me the thing you want me to share. Yeah, um, bear with me if I can. Uh, I, I can or you can it. just press that. Yeah, press that share plus. <laughs> Hopefully this might work. I'm going to send it in the private chat, and you'll see what it's all. No, it didn't paste. That's not working. But anyway, it's it's base. Um, 
give me a second. It's uh, if you the HTC virtual reality commercials. Oh, um, that yeah. The, are you I mean, talking if you look about at the, the actual image? Advertising, it's like it's not presented as look. Here's a game. Here's a game. They don't sell games. They sell experiences. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, if you send it to me, I'll edit it on top of this part of the video when we're all right. And uh, I'll <laughs> go, send go you with the can... flow, right? How go with the flow. That's it. Go with the flow. But it's all this idea of even if you're looking at say uh, Project Cambria that's coming out, it's this idea of it. Well, you 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 put um, it's about optimizing the self, but uh, the, and you put your virtual reality on, and you can find a way of 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 uh, optimizing your productivity but you know if you look at the the aesthetic how it's presented it's presented as some sublime experience something that's just held just out the way but that's just one aspect you know it, it's pretty much permeates all aspect and part of the book you know what i'm trying to write is precisely what you just pointed out alfie it, it's it's articulating how that type of spirituality discourse or rhetoric is inherently caught up with the attention economy and that's that's what it is and trying to articulate it in, in you know by just pointing out little examples it's not going to uh uh wash very well but i'm hoping that in the book i can i can articulate myself a little bit better <laughs> Does that make- uh, elliot do you want to ask something oh before? right i mean one of the things in the writing that you sent us uh you talked a bit about hiddenness uh as yeah. a kind of liberatory process but interestingly enough you also talked about kind of the jouissance of isolation. And I think there's this kind of interest. I, I was hoping you can maybe, the American word, expand. Right. So, um, <laughs> these, these, are, these kind of like open isolationness and connected hiddenness or what, 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 is, what is the significance of these kind of ideas so of isolation? What I, I've been hiddenness. reading a lot of Byung Chul Han. You know, so, uh, his uh, work on capital and the death drive. And he gives a brilliant article about how the era that we're in now, we're in this era of, I think Helen Bruch calls it monstration. The idea that we're constantly present, constantly online. Everyone's judging everyone. And uh, spaces are closing in. And it, what we find is a transformation of personal narrative into data. Everything becomes quantified. Uh, quantified through this logic, endless op- uh, uh, logic of optimization, and what I what, what I was interested is uh, what I was interested in in terms of how this relates to darkness, mysticism, and also object orientated ontology is the idea of hiddenness as a way of disrupting that. So um, how can we become? How can we you know, extract ourselves from the 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 the, the, digi- the endless digital gaze? So there's two. Two aspects to darkness spirit, an, an exoteric and esoteric. The end- can, we, uh, can you can you um, uh, explain like a bit more what darkness mysticism is just from this from the beginning? Ah, okay, I'll sorry. Like that. <laughs> darkness mysticism, right? So dark or mystical theology is uh, it's generally split into so spirituality is generally split into two discourses, what we call the cataphatic and the apophatic. Okay, cataphatic means a spirituality of images. Uh, and you know symbols, words, etc. So it's very much a positive thing. Okay, so it's a positive spirituality of images and words. Then you have what we call the apophatic, and this you know stems from the work of pseudo again pseudo Dionysus, but it's also something that you find right the way through different mystics like John of the Cross. And the apophatic is this idea that the closer we we get to um, in our you know, progress with God or you know, getting closer to God is that we can't say what he is, but we can only say what he's not. So it's this idea of a constant stripping away of all positive content until what's left is just emptiness or darkness. OK, now what I, what I, what I found in my when I was doing my PhD is that there were, uh, with the psychologization of spirituality or spiritual discourse, is that these this idea of darkness as you you are basically stripping away all positive content about the, the theological attributes of God or whatever? Is that okay? Well, what what's left? What's left? And they interpreted it as well. What you're left with is a type of experience, okay? A psychological experience, the sublime. The uh, Rudolf Otto uh, talks about the mysterious tremidums and, and, and other things, but it's all this idea of a psychologized experience. What's left is this pure experience. 
And for me, big questions come come about that because if you you know that there is a type of irrationality of capitalism, right? Yeah. Capitalism itself strips itself away constantly, you know, in, in terms of rational goals. So what's left at the end of it, again, you know, especially in the discourses that we have, is a type of sublime experience that's promised just around the corner. But what I found is that the this idea of interpreting these these mystics, these mystical theologians, as as uh, arbiters of experience over rationale. That's not the case. It wasn't the case. There's very little reference to um, experience in, say, pseudo Dionysus. It's something that's read into it later on as an idea. So if it's not about experience, then what is it? It's got to be about something else. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to articulate well, how can these darkness mystics, say, these people who are anti experience, what I believe is anti experientialist, can they? Offer is a discourse of resisting the experientialism uh, or the perennial experientialism that's thrust upon us from all sides in capitalism. That, that's that's yeah. what I'm trying to cool. get at. Right. Um, it's really, really helpful. Um, and I'm getting I'm getting to, towards understanding it. And you, this is also way in the paper you say that um, a com you're asking the question, basically, can a combination of psychoanalysis and the practice of darkness mysticism offer us a way out of this kind of perpetual injunction to enjoy which is kind of forced upon us by capitalism and now by, in particular, digital capitalism and the attention economy. So yeah. there's one last question before you, you try and sort of answer that. What is the connection between darkness, mysticism and psychoanalysis? Why are you uniting these two things? And it's something I've often thought about before. Like there, there are other, there's actually a podcast on psychoanalysis and mysticism and things like this. It's, people are working in this connection between these two things, but I've never quite understood how so so why are you like um uniting darkness mysticism with psychoanalysis as a kind of couple of tools that can work together against this kind of capitalism that we're in well my my thing is that if you look at the writings of Lacan and um you know he's very much says in the triumph of religion you know he says i'm the product of priests or jesuits you know, it's, it's, uh, he's very much but if you look at the writings of Lacan it's 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 false to say that you know Lacan was ultimately a secret mystic you know, or, or a mystical deal. But there is things in his writings where he does see the value of the, the, the value of the structure of mystical discourses. Okay. And you see it very much so in, in I think it's seminar three, uh, where he makes reference to John of the Cross um, and the Dark Knight of the Soul, but also very much in seminar 20, in seminar, uh, the, the mystical seminar, he, he, where he comes up with the concept of feminine jouissance and, 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 and uh, and, and how he uses that um, to be able to talk about uh, the non-rapport and the not all. Uh, these these are very important concepts that you know that, that, that loads of lots of really important psychoanalysts are trying to expound today. Uh, Lorenzo Chalizia uh, book uh, um, is one of the best books I've I've read I've read on it. It's fantastic. Um, but for me uh, myself, the connection between darkness mysticism. Uh, the darkness mysticism and, and its connection to things you know, um, in psychoanalysis, it's inherently caught up with the concept of things like subject of destitution and the past. This moment where what's at stake is not some promise or experience that's, that's demanded from the psychoanalyst, some moment, but a moment where the fictions fall away. Uh, the fictions fall away and there is a type of transformation, a complete transformation. Uh, the subject falls away, and what's left is the waste, uh, that in, in, as has been as, uh, said in, in other seminars. And it's in that transformation, that moment where the, the, in the past, uh, I believe, is inherently connected to things like uh, John, of the Co John of the Cross's concept of the dark night of the soul, which, again, isn't just about some sublime experience. It's about a transformation. It's about a transformation. Um, does that make sense? I think, you know, it probably yeah. doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, I, I mean, my questions are just coming from naivety, really. I don't know about this history, this whole theological history that you're implying. But now I feel like I understand more. And that was all, I guess that was all on the way to getting to your question, Elliot. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's, it's all good. Thank you for, you know, that's it. Um, well, I mean, yeah, when, I, I when I hear that dark, the dark transformation almost reminds me of uh, trauma. And, you know, you, you talk about kind of the need to rediscover kind of this impact of the real a bit yeah, yeah. Um, but this is something kind of that's missing from no but this is something that's really important i think elliot because i think 
there has been a commodification of trauma discourse too, right? Would you say, like it, you see it as a sort of permeated everywhere? Every, every people are talking about trauma in different ways. But I think some of the the the, the radicality of what trauma is and how it can shake up uh, the symbolic. You know that that sort of gets lost in the mix because it's completely you know commodified and caught up in various permutations of capital that uh, that that move forward through this constant promise of the therapeutic in various different ways. And I think that you know, it's it's uh, we need to recapture things of the the power of trauma, the wound, uh, which is you know taught you know in which you find very much in mystical discourse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean. Um... You, you sort of actually uh, approach some of this through um, talking about, I mean, in, the, in, your, in your talk, you talked about your experience during COVID and things like that. I wonder if it's worth going through this kind of um, stuff as a way of thinking about the relationship between spirituality and capitalism, I guess. And, and you know, and then you sort of come to your main question, which as you, you raised before, like this question of like opting, opting out, let's say, like, you know, is there a way to opt out of this, um, you know, this relationship to the attention economy and what would that look like right so why don't you like just take take us through that part of the argument really the question of um opting out and how you got to that point or considering that point well the thing is is that you know the idea of what opting out is and how we can opt out i don't want it to be just another um another reiteration of bartleby the scrivener uh, i yeah. i want to try and articulate something else and I think there are, the, the, if we are talking about opting out, it has to be a way that isn't reactionary, right? Now, this is a question that was brought up when Elliot talking about isolation again. You know, I think that there's two forms of isolation. I think that there's isolation um, of the capitalist discourse. You know, there. So you've got the four discourses in Lacan, but the, the fifth discourse is. Um, it is uh, uh, the capitalist discourse is one of isolation. It closes down the space uh, where we can, you know, have a relation to the other, and it burns itself out completely. And I think the psychoanalyst Wolfing gives a great exposition of the isolation of the capitalist discourse. But there is also the isolation of the analytic discourse because the past and subjective destitution is ultimately an isolatory act. But what's the difference? What's the difference between these forms of isolation? I believe that the analytic act that you see in, in, the, in, the, in the last Lacan, especially in Seminar 24, um, uh, where he's taught, um, love is the failure of the one conscious or one unconscious, is that there has to be a stepping out of the isolation of the syntho. Because in Seminar 23, you see that he's articulating the knots He's talking about the synthome. He's talking about the name, how that can hold together. But he also articulates a problem of the, the isolatory nature of George. You know, just stuck on his typewriter, stuck forever, you know, on his typewriter. So in Seminar 24, he tries to talk about, well, how do we reach out from that? How do we move out? How can we actually allow ourselves to be able to connect to the other? And he talks about love. He talks about the idea that love is, a, is ultimately a fiction, but it's a necessary fiction where we can invent the other. OK, and so I think it's got the isolation that we're talking about in darkness. Spirituality is a way of resisting uh, capitalist discourse because it leads nowhere. There's no space for reinventing fictions because all fictions are commodified. And then in, in, in the analytic discourse, the analytic discourse, there is a way of being able to reinvent fictions. But there's a problem because Lacan very clearly says that, you know, that the analytic discourse can't be a model for politics. And I know that there is this leads me to an impasse or trying to articulate right. how we can use it, right? And we because, all ignore him. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so we, but, it's, but there are great sort of uh, psychoanalysts like Dwayne Russell, who's uh, tr trying to talk about how we can look at the cartel or the model of the car the, the, uh, the Lacanian cartel as a model of being able to talk about it. And he he writes about this in relation to anarchism. But a lot of important works that you know, are going on there, and I'm uh, that's something I'm I'm really yeah. interested in. You know? Listeners, uh, listeners can check out our interview with Dwayne Roussel uh, in the playlist. <laughs> um, I, I did some cartels also in my time uh, in doing Lacanian psychoanalysis in Manchester. I find them really, really interesting. Um, but I wanted to come to something. I mean, one of the things I really liked in your talk is what you just said about love. I think it's actually quite a interesting Lacanian and also just 
plainly romantic idea of what love is because in a sense you're you're starting from the point of there is no sexual relation or whatever or you know this kind of uh, often interpreted as a sort of um depressing uh, take on what a relationship is because there's always this non-recognition this kind of missing uh, uh lacking in the other whatever no you know so it's it's a psychoanalytic critique of um of the, the promise industry that we were talking about and of course we you know we talk, could think about that in online dating dating in general right the idea that you'll be made complete or whole by a, a lover or an individual or whatever um and, and so this is a kind of psychoanalytic critique of that which is often interpreted as a sort of depressing or negative critique in the sense that you know it's saying you'll never be fulfilled and so on but in fact it's it's not that at all is it and i think it's extremely like nice the way you put it that love is a, is a fiction that covers up this misrelation and uh, yeah. that is what love is so every yeah. connection every relationship is a failed one but love is the name of the fiction which covers up that failure or speaks over it or something i think that's really important and you know yeah what, what do you think about that idea i just i mean you i've got it no, from I, you. Think, I think you sum it up well i think uh you know, I think someone, I was in a cartel the other day, someone someone put it really, really, it was Alistair Duncan, actually. He was, he was saying that, you know, that what the past consists of, you know, and it's it's this idea of uh, fictions becoming, um, you know, they're not universalised. You know, they, they stop being these universalised reality. And, you know, you can see these things like in, you know, these those you know, sitcoms, like what's it called? How I Met Your Mother. You know, there is this sort of implicit theological understanding of what love is. Love is connected to the, the universe and the universe knows and it's going to lead us to it. And we all talk about love with a, with a capital L. And, you know, what, what, what we need to under, you know, understand is that, you know, if we take the non-report seriously, uh, you know, as, as being at the basis, the ontological basis of who we are, this absolute antagonistic failure that never gets there, is that things like love, it's not that they don't, it don't, they don't exist. They just exist in, in much smaller ways. They, they, you know, small outs. It's a small out. You know, love does exist. But it's a fiction. It's a fiction that's necessary for us to be able to live in the world and to be able to, um, you know, um, you know, reach out to the other. And I, I, this is something we were discussing as well, is that what's really important in analysis is not to reach a cynical end of analysis. Right? So, Mark, can I, can, can I ask you a totally off-topic question? Well, not totally off-topic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The fiction of love, this is a bit yeah. provocative. Um, I keep both in personal friend circles and in clients, I'm getting this kind of topic of the crisis of love via the establishment of um, polyamory. Okay. Right. Uh, I think in, in more, you know, as I'm in a monogamous relationship, um, yeah. Uh, sorry if this is way too off topic, but I, I feel like it won't be. I feel like you can <laughs> maybe help me out here. Um, what What is this kind of um, fiction's relation to, I guess, big other or the big other or societal norms? Because I I, I don't I don't know what uh, what to, what to make of our each little individual machinations of love. This seems like very kind of like hyper individualist or well i think uh, you know if you know i think half of the problems that we have today is you know and this is you know a, a, a sort of prosaic philosophical point is that we've lost the language of love right you know if you look at sort of what love actually is or how we talk about it we always talk about love you know as romantic love. when if you look back in ancient you know pre-modern times the greeks had like five or six seven different terms for what love is you know it's diff it's it was multifaceted and big and regarding questions like you know polyamory i think you know in, in, in analysis it's like you know i remember speaking to to my analyst i know i'm in a monogamous relationship as well as but it's it's this this idea that you know people struggle and suffer precisely because they are held by a certain fiction about what love is and and how they have to adhere to it and half of the 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 process of analysis is is getting people to give up give up that universalized idea about what it is and allow smaller ideas and sometimes that that um giving up a, a big idea about what love is and how it's connected to patriarchy and, and you know and monogamy people 
you know, on a one by one basis, that people can give that up and have ideas of polyamory, and that would be a completely liberatory thing for them. You know, it's 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 it, 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 it's, it's all on a one one on one basis. I mean, is this not your experience? Yeah. And, and, and not so, your experience. I, mean, in, in I, I, I don't mean to make you my personal, you know, doctoral <laughs> uh, psychoanalyst here in terms of I, I, I'm just I'm really curious about why this is such a crisis for people um, in their kind of personal relationships. And I, I think there's also this promise of polyamory to exceed the symbolic or to kind of, uh, you know, which it, I, it almost seems like this is speaking of reactionary takes it kind of you get close to this reactionary idea that polyamory itself is is kind of this symptom of infinite uh, enjoyment. Right. I, I find it hard for myself to. Yeah. Excuse. Please correct my reaction. I mean, let's, because let's bring in because one of the things we were going to yeah. talk about is the question of incels. So let's All right. <laughs> combine these three things. Oh yeah, please, please. On the one it. hand, you've got the idea of polyamory, where you know, as Elliot's saying, one one possible reading is this kind of infinite uh, plethora of love. Or then with um, the incel thing, you've got the sort of annexing off of sex, or presumably with it, relationships and love. Um, and then, so, so they, in a sense, they're opposites. But these are three different kinds of fictions, I suppose. You know, your traditional monogamous idea of love, your, your, um, your, your I'm an incel who can't have love, <laughs> and your polyamorous, I'm going to have uh, an infinite excess of love, are three different kinds of fictions, which all operate to kind of cover up the failed relationship. Would that be right, Mark? <laughs> I think, that's, uh, I think um, I, I, in the last Lacan, you know, the, I think you can split Lacan into, you know, early, middle, late, last, you know. <laughs> It's uh, he talks about um, the corollary of the fa of of the of the um, uh, the f of the non report, and he, you know, the corollary of the non report is the one all alone. Um, and I think you know how what what's really important today uh, in speaking about things like incel culture, which is a real real problem. You know, it's it's you know, and and how how we can find a language of being able to be able to discuss that problem in psychoanalytic terms, the several things that I believe, and I work with, with Dwayne Russell and, and others on this, is that we need to recognize how we are living in an era where of jouissance as such, where capitalism is just this endless, perm endless permutations of enjoyment that are being thrust upon us on all angles, which results in total isolation. And I believe that that isolation the isolation comes in various forms. It doesn't just come in the form of the incel. It can come just as much on, you know, aspects of, of the left and, and um, how, you know, how it's endlessly engaging in antagonism and arguments within itself. The different ways of the one all alone permeating, uh, uh, presenting itself. And I, th I think that, you know, we need to be able to talk about Jouissant. And that means that we need to be able to, I think, on some ways, especially with Lacanian analysis, giving up um, uh, things about constitutive, uh, the language of desire or the idea of constitutive lack and, and, and desire as such. I think that that sort of language, um, I think that, can, that, that disguises... Uh, the problem of isolating of isolatory jouissance, and I think that we need to find ways of being able to uh, focus on the last Lacan, where he talks about the one all alone, and talks about uh, jouissance as such, and to be able to, to um, allow ourselves to be able to use those terms to I, to talk about incel culture and and, and whatnot. Explain. I what really, the... yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I really like that because you, when you hear about the one, especially in spirituality, even in actual spirituality, like kind of going back to the harmony of the one, uh, you go to you could go to Hegel to a certain degree, and you can go to Chinese philosophy as well. It's nice to hear the one as like this is not the ultimate uh, level of sublation where we are all having a sublime experience, but in fact, the one is a symptom. Right. <laughs> and this is that's like quite a big turn, I think, in terms of spirituality and in terms of what is what is the purpose of like an, a symptom and identifying something as a symptom rather than as 
pure meaning and enjoyment, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, so ju just, just, can you just, um, Mark, you know, tell us what, give us a bit of a definition of the one all alone and how you would relate that to incel culture if you, if you had to do that. Well, I think it's precisely what you were just saying, you know, Alfie, it's, it's if we're talking about the failure of the non-report and the inability to create, um, you know, fictions is that the, the, we are left with the one, we are left with, with just uh, the, uh, the nonsensical symptom and uh, the isolatory nature of that. But it's something I, I'm trying to work out more and, and to yeah. be able to articulate. But it's but my, I, what I'm really interested in is is precisely the idea of you know, love, not as something which can be discarded and thrown away, but love as a, a type of field of invention. Yeah. Love as a type of field of invention where we can escape the isolatory um, predicament and crises that we're in. And yeah. so, so then you've got love as a, I suppose you could talk about love in the imaginary, um, where it's just identification one-on-one, -on -one, you know, where you are, you know, I, I recognize myself in you and whatnot. And then you can talk about uh, love and love in the symbolic, which is ultimately a question of transference, right? And then you've got love in the real. And I think love in the real is, is, is that moment of realizing that you are, there is the failure that the not there is the non-report. There is a failure. It can't be um, gotten rid of. That antagonism is always there. But there is also the field of invention. We even though we are isolated and even though we are one alone, there is always the possibility of invention and the ability to be able to create a symbolic again. Um, yeah. You know, being able to give space and create the unconscious. That's, that's I think um, I think that's right, and I think that I mean I want I would want to maybe say that both polyamory and incel culture fall into the same trap of locating the of of not recognizing the non rapport of the relationship. So you know, for the incel, if only I could have that sex moment, uh, you know, the rapport would would be felt. With polyamory, I couldn't get it from one person, but there's an ultimate point where by the correct combination of multiple people, I can reach this moment of rapport. Is so that the uh, Lacanian quote, how many uh, lovers does it matter? If, um, how many lovers does, it ha does it ma I have if none of them can give me the universe? Is that exactly. uh, yeah, right? This Great yeah. quote. <laughs> so, and I also think that you, you know, you, in a way, you, what you just said, kind of brings this discussion of background to where we started. So you're in a sense saying that this cons, you started by, by thinking about the position of us as subjects in the capitalism of the attention economy. You're now sort of approaching the question of love as a possible means maybe as a, uh, to break out of or opt out of this situation that you've kind of described and noticed. So I, th I think that's really interesting. And I suppose just one sort of question there, which we haven't come back to is what about the question of, spirituality here or or love of god or something or you know is this also part of what's going on here is is the is there a spiritual sense of of, of love here which is the part of this opting out of the well, i think for myself it's you know I, I i you're asking what is this uh you know secretly theological discourse where i'm going to pull out god out of the air, <laughs> well, kind of thing. and i think that that's a fair enough question alfie you know i right. think that that's a fair but I'm, i don't intend to i believe to show what what i'm interested in is, is you know very much along the zizekian lines you, yeah. know, you know if you look at zizek he is very much you know, he's enamored with theology and he writes a hell of a lot and you know about it even in his in his in his last book he has a whole exposition going off about meister eckhart he's also an eight he's also pretty much an atheist but he's very much caught up with this but I'm, i myself i'm not an atheist okay but i don't want to I don't want to sort of um, present this stuff. What I want to say is that there is value in this this this, this stuff. There is psychoanalytic value in theological discourse, yeah. and we can and we should use it. I don't yeah. intend to throw, uh, you know, um, you know, proselytize or anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not meant, something I'm interested in. Um, in your own terms, I want, I was wondering whether the love of God was another necessary fiction that covers up the non-relation in in a, in a sometimes useful way i wasn't uh, accusing you of secretly <laughs> but, but but yeah i mean in a way they could be i mean these i mean you could almost see the whole re religious project as this 
intricate, necessary fiction that speaks towards lack in this way. I wonder if that was your sense of. Well, I think that what's a core percent you can, if you look at a Christological argument, it's very much, you know, uh, if you, if you see, um, you know, decades before Christ came and stuff, you know, people were, you know, gazing up to heaven, expect, ex ex expecting some, you know, sublime experience. And then all of a sudden, you find that, uh, you know, the, the, or the mythology goes, Christ is you know born in a stable covered in crap. You know, it's it's uh, and and then at the end of it, he has this. Um, people are expecting it to be like a, you know a, a, a king and not. No, he's he's crucified in the worst way possible. You know, it's like the, mm -hmm. being crucified is the very worst thing. So people are looking at this. You know, there's a question: Where's the party? Yeah, where's the party? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when's it going to happen? You know, but, but the point is that you know it's it's um, the idea of I think if you look at Christ, from a Christological perspective, and you know you take strip everything away from that, there is this idea of um, the Christ figure, and I think you know Zizek rec recognizes this as well as something that ultimately disturbs and you know throws and shows very much so that a lot of our conceptions about religion, religion and whatnot is made up of fictions. You yeah. know, if you're looking at them, I think Terry Eagleton said it beautifully. He said, you know, Christ didn't just identify with flesh. He identified with mangled human flesh. And, you know, and then there's something, you know, genuinely horrific and monstrous about about Christ that, you know, throws into question um, all those various fictions. Yeah. And that's something if I'm writing, it's something that I want to be able to, um, you know, highlight. But, you know, I digress. No, no it's interesting. The I real love... of mangled human flesh. <laughs> Very visceral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, any, any last questions or comments, Elliot? Um, I think it's really good. You know, on other podcasts, you might get uh, you might get Joe Rogan, but on this podcast, you'll get, let me check my notes, love opts out of the one, parenthesis, symptomatic, via a field of invention, and that's what you get on sci-fi. Really? <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate you uh, talking with us about this. No, I appreciate you giving me the is... opportunity. I've just, uh, I've just yeah. literally, just at this very moment, I'll share this with you. I've just uh, got a contract offer from from Palgrave. So thank hey. you very much. Hey. <laughs> yeah. 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 is, is it a sign from the substantial drink. one, which is the Christian <laughs> God? I mean, I'm Jewish, but uh, who's to say? You know, there you no go. one's ever got. A... <laughs> live on the show before so literally they... just happened to <laughs> do right this moment i was being like it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a miracle from the substantial <laughs> one there you oh, go. now we're in a totally different direction next podcast <laughs> well, no, but honestly, well, no, listen this 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 has been really helpful for me you know and i think you know i, I think most people if you're doing an, a, a, a phd or you've done a phd or you're writing something like this there is an aspect of being the one all alone right it's it becomes a sort of like solipsistic isolatory experience and you don't know whether your, your any ideas are leading anywhere but having a conversation like this you know and being able to sort of talk a little bit about what i'm doing and getting feedback from you you guys it's it's been helpful and i really appreciate it yeah no it's been great thank you so much for joining us and thanks everyone for listening and congratulations mark on your book <laughs> thanks huge news <laughs> live oh, on the man. show and uh, yeah, we'll see you all next week. Thanks so much for listening again. And uh, yeah, have a good yeah. weekend, everyone. Thanks very much.